alt histories of cosmopolitanism rewriting the past in the service of the future by david inglis the intellectual field of cosmopolitanism studies has developed tremendously over the last 20 years like every intellectual field it has narrowed its own origins with the growth of such fields in part stimulated excuse me like every intellectual field it has narrated its own right origins with the growth of such fields in part stimulated by debates and disputes as to what those origins may be there are now readily available histories which endeavor to trace out the genealogy of cosmopolitan concerns from the ancient greeks generally taken as the original source of cosmopolitical reflections in the quote west end quote down until the present day such synoptic histories allow scholars in the field to come to forms of self-understanding vis-a-vis both valued intellectual inheritances and also legacies from the past to be rejected or avoided. But as with all such genealogies, after a while certain orthodoxies and narration can arise with subsequent authors reproducing rather than interrogating the histories offered by earlier contributors. The history of a field can become frozen, reproducing unquestioned verities, verities instead of interrogating standard narrations. When standard narrations overly dominate more heterodox understandings of the roots and branches of the field, this threatens to close off opportunities for developing fresh foci and forms of thinking figures. The standard narration of the historical development of cosmopolitanism in the, quote, West, end quote, exhibits such risks. The standard narration that has become an orthodox one identifies the beginnings of cosmopolitanism in Greek cynicism and stoicism. Nussbaum, 1997, examines the, the Roman adaptation of these ideas jumps to the 18th century, where the name of Kant is above all invoked as the greatest of all Enlightenment philosophers of cosmopolitanism, identifies a decline in the 19th century of cosmopolitical concerns as European thought succumbs to the siren songs of nationalism, sees a rejuvenation of cosmopolitical concerns after World War II as political theorists and others identify post-war putatively global institutions like the United Nations as embodiments of Kantian concerns, with the story ending with the remarkable flourishing and diversification of the cosmopolitan intellectual field in recent times. All of this is not untrue, just as something called, quote, classical sociology, end quote, operates as a useful constructed canon of works and authors that allow sociologists to narrate their apparent past, construe their present and future, and teach students what are taken to be the elementary building blocks of the discipline, so too does the standard narration allow for such achievements to be possible in the new field called, quote, cosmopolitan studies, end quote. But the narration of Greece, Rome, Enlightenment 1945 now, while useful as a ground-setting fable, threatens to turn into unexamined, quote, truth, end quote. There is, in fact, much more to be said about cosmopolitanism and its histories in the plural. There is a, quote, long, rich, and varied history, end quote, of cosmopolitical ideas about the, quote, whole world, end quote, that remains relatively untapped by standard narration. The Eurocentric bias of that standard narration is obvious and has not gone unchallenged. With alternative locations and genealogies of cosmopolitical thought and action being offered, partly meeting Delante's injunction for scholars to integrate into the history of the field cosmopolitan theories which, quote, cannot be explained in terms of a single Western notion of modernity, end quote. Delante is the editor of this entire uh, volume, so I guess he's a big figure in cosmopolitan stu cosmopolitanism studies. Cosmopolitan cultural dynamics can be discerned in various forms of, quote, European, end quote, encounters with non-European others. Revisionist historians can narrate the, quote, European Renaissance, end quote, of the 15th and 16th centuries, not as a series of developments endogenous to, quote, Europe, end quote, but rather the emergent property of shifting relations between Christendom and different wings of the Islamic world. Even within that, 
excuse me, even within what is conventionally called, quote, European, end quote, thought, a critical genealogist can discern forms of thinking that are important for the retelling of the history of cosmopolitanisms in the plural. This involves two dimensions, first offering alternative accounts of the nature and significance of ideas and authors already consecrated by the standard narration, and second, the identification of ideas and thinkers not conventionally conventionally designated as, quote, cosmopolitan, end quote, but inclusion of which in the history of cosmopolitanisms can both enrich the existing canon and help to recalibrate our views of what it is and can do. In what follows, I will indicate certain forms of thought which merit inclusion within a broader, broadened understanding of precursors of contemporary cosmopolitical concerns. Most of these are, quote, Western in provenance, but I also include the anti-Western colonial thinking of Frantz Fanon. I also want to indicate certain neglected or occluded dimensions of canonical schools of thought, notably Greco-Roman Stoicism and Kantian political philosophy. I assert that there is a neglected but important historiographical and sociological dimension to these forms of cosmopolitan thinking involving endeavors to root more abstract political, philosophical, and metaphysical concerns in empirical historical conditions. On this view, even the most apparently abstract and utopian aspects of, quote, classical, end quote, cosmopolitan thought, features which it is today routinely criticized for, are rooted to some extent in, quote, empirical concerns as to how cosmopolitan norms and imperatives will or could be brought into tangible existence. These forms of classical cosmopolitanism cannot just be written off as abstract utopianism, for, what, for they endeavor to think through how normative dispositions could be empirically realized. This seems an important focus for retelling the history of cosmopolitanism in a period when multiple endeavors are afoot to conceive of how cosmopolitical concerns at the level of thought can be brought more fully into the level of practice. Between normative and empirical, ancient thought. Any treatise on the history of cosmopolitan thought contains depictions of its beginnings in ancient Greece and its Cynic and Stoic origins. Diogenes, founding figure of the Cynic school, quote, declared himself a polis, without a city, a oikos, homeless, and cosmopolitus, a citizen of the universe. The Greek Stoics argued that government, politeia, should be coextensive with the whole inhabited world, oikomena, or the whole people, universe, excuse me, or the whole cosmos, excuse me, or the whole universe, cosmos, rather than being limited to a particular city-state. All people, regardless of race or religion or place of origin, were to be understood as members of one human brotherhood. Roman Stoics, notably Marcus Aurelius and Cicero, further developed these within the multi-ethnic conditions of the Roman Empire. For Marcus Aurelius, quote, There is a world law, which in turn means that we are all fellow citizens and share a common citizenship and that the world is a single city, end quote. According to Cicero, the gods treat the world, quote, as though it were a single state or city, end quote, and thus have, quote, care for all men, bracket, sick, and bracket, everywhere, on every shore and in every country of the earth, however far from our own homeland, end quote. The history of ancient cosmopolitanism is generally narrated in such a way that it concentrates on metaphysical and politico-theoretical ideas. This has been reinforced in the present day by the fact that it has been political philosophers, especially Martha Nussbaum, who have been primarily responsible for bringing ancient cosmopolitanism into contemporary debates. As a result, there is today only an overly narrow appreciation of ancient cosmopolitanism as wholly political, theoretical in nature. It follows that ancient cosmopolitanism seems to involve the abstract and utopian schemes of a tiny group of philosophers, either socially marginal, as in the Greek case, or occupying positions of power, 
but mouthing empty platitudes about universal brotherly love is in the Roman context. The standard narration ignores at least two issues. First, the fact that cosmopolitan notions are rooted in and help to develop broader visions of the world as a complex, increasingly interconnected whole that were common in Hellenistic Greece and the Roman Empire, not just among the philosophical minority, but among varied social strata. Second, the standard narration omits mention of a different stream of thought that draws upon, but is irreducible to, cynic and stoic cosmopolitical notions. This alternative current adapted cosmopolitical philosophy for historiographical purposes, a new kind of historiography called, quote, universal history, end quote, by its practitioners, grew out of the social conditions of the Hellenistic age. This, quote, was a genre for its time. It provided a view of history which was capable of giving an account of the entire new world opened up by the conquest of Alexander the Great, of incorporating the experiences of the Barbaroi as something less than exotic and of providing a sense of unity within diversity, end quote. I don't know who said the quote. The guiding aim was to, quote, acquaint people with the meaning of the international experience which they were living out, end quote. Mortley, 1996. So maybe it was Mortley. Universal history took as its subject matter not particular political entities such as city-states or empires as previous historiography had, but rather the whole, quote, inhabited world, end quote. Oikumena. O-I-K-O-U-M-E-N-E. -E. Endeavoring to narrate the intermeshed affairs of the whole world, not just part of it. For Diodorus of Sicily, in the first century BCE, historiography regarded the, quote, affairs of the entire world as if they were the affairs of some single city, end quote. The most ambitious and sophisticated of the universal historians was Polybius, writing in the middle of the 2nd century BCE. Tracing the history of Roman overseas expansion, he described the shift from an oikomene, oikomene made up of relatively disconnected places and nations and towards one characterized by increasingly interpenetrating forces. Quote, in earlier times, the world's history had consisted of a series of unrelated episodes, the origins and results of each being as widely separated as their localities. But then, bracket, after the Roman expansion had begun, end bracket, history becomes an organic whole, bracket, somatitis, end bracket, the affairs of Italy and Africa are connected with those of Asia and of Greece, and all events bear a relationship and contribute to a single end, end quote. Polybius. As a later interpreter noted, Polybius's vision held that, quote, the differences between the different states and different cities disappears. The world increasingly resembles a single place, end quote. While he drew upon Stoic political, theoretical, and metaphysical conceptions of the, quote, whole world, end quote, part of the common intellectual currency of the time, he moved beyond its understanding of that world being constituted of naturally and eternally separate places and polities towards a focus on the historical construction of the somatidis oikomene, the whole world being characterized by increasingly dense connectivity, a condition of complex globality. Here, then, is a very significant move beyond Stoic metaphysics and political theory where the world is merely like one single state, but empirically made up of multiple polities and where universal human brotherhood is just theoretical abstraction. For Polybius and other universal historians, the empirical world is moving in concrete directions towards making it really a single polity and all the people within it citizens of one state. Of course, this is in part propaganda for Polybius's patrons, the Roman elite, but it still signifies a major 
empirical shift in Stoic influence thought, a shift ignored by the standard narration. Such a shift can also be seen in the Roman historian Plutarch, another figure not usually included in the cosmopolitical canon. In his account of Alexander the Great, Plutarch depicts standard, abstract Stoic themes of universal brotherhood. Quote, we should consider all men to be one of community and one of one community and one polity, end quote. But to these considerations is added a strongly empirical dimension. Alexander is presented as that apparent anomaly, an activist Stoic, who endeavored to relinquish hitherto unbridgeable divines between Greeks and non-Greeks, bringing into actual existence the world state that had previously existed only in abstract potential. Quote, he brought together into one body all men everywhere, uniting and mixing, men's lives, their characters, their marriages, their very habits of life. He bade them all consider as their fatherland the whole inhabited earth, bracket and, and bracket, as akin to them all good men, and as foreigners only the wicked, end quote. Plutarch. Alexander created at the level of empirical socio-political affairs the hitherto purely metaphysical cosmopolitical condition. As Stoic ph political philosophy is transformed into and through historiography, the focus radically drifts from, excuse me, shifts from potentials to actualities. It is wrong to regard ancient Stoicism as a purely abstract, non-empirical affair, as the standard narration alleges. For when we broaden the horizon to include Stoic-influenced historiography as well as political theory, we see that the normative and empirical could be fused together and not always wholly separated. Between empirical and normative, Kant's philosophy. Regarding this late, later thinkers who took up the mantle of ancient cosmopolitanism cannot be regarded as simply prisoners of a tradition which was thoroughly non-empirical in nature. This point applies to Kant's famous appropriation of Stoic themes. In recent debates stimulated by the interventions like Nussbaum and Habermas, Kant has generally been portrayed as operating at a primarily political theoretical level, just like indeed implicitly, because of his indebtedness to his ancient antecedents. That has meant that historiography historiographical, anthropological, and sociological dimensions of Kant's cosmopolitical vision have been seriously underplayed. As is well known, Kant's endeavors to reground political philosophy on a cosmopolitan basis tried to avoid the utopianism of previous world state plans such as that of Abbé Saint Pierre, instead of looking to a league of sovereign states which would respect the law of, quote, universal hospitality, end quote, allowing individuals to travel and trade as they wish and not to be subjected to arbitrary uses of power, Kant claimed that this situation was imminently practicable, for human history was inexorably moving in that direction. The end point of human societal evolution was a condition where different human communities had learned to live together without conflict arising between them. Against a Hobbesian view of the eternal nature of inter-individual and interstate strife, Kant contended that it was conflict itself which drove historical development toward its eventual permanently peaceful outcome. Humans learn over time from the experience of incessant warfare that the best means of meeting their interests, individual and collective, was to engage in peaceful association, not just within states, but between states too. One important empirical reason why this cosmopolitical condition eventually appears concerns the geographical limits of the planet. All humans, quote, excuse me, all humans have, quote, common possession of the surface of the earth, where, as a globe, they cannot infinitely disperse and hence must finally tolerate the presence of each other, end quote. Literally, world history involves initial human dispersal across the planet, followed by increasing interconnection between, the ge between geographically disparate parts. It was warfare between groups which pushed some of them into even the most inhospitable icy and desert regions of the planet. The next stage is that nature, by placing, quote, each people near another which presses upon it, end quote, 
compels each group to, quote, form itself into a state in order to defend itself, end quote. Two cultural factors further provoke interstate hostility, quote, differences of language and of religion involve a tendency to mutual hatred and pretext for war, end quote. Eventually, each group becomes so sickened by war that it wants to enter into the Pacific League of States. In addition, international trade develops over time and different states, quote, unite because of mutual interest. The spirit of commerce, which is incompatible with war, sooner or later gains the upper hand in every state. States see themselves forced without any moral urge to promote honorable peace, end quote. The tendency of world-level tra- world trading relations is that, quote, understanding conventions and peaceable relations, bracket, are, end bracket, established among the most distant peoples, end quote. In sum, the unintended consequences of geographical dispersal, warfare, and trade all combine as mechanisms generating, quote, a universal cosmopolitan condition, end quote. These are the empirical means by which a world-level moral community is beginning to appear within which, quote, a violation of rights in one place is felt throughout the world, end quote. Regardless of where violations occur, the condemnation that follows is literally global in that it is the moral response of the whole world itself, understood as a single moral entity. Such a position, simultaneously normative and empirical, allows Kant the grounds to condemn European states which failed to observe the evolving world-level moral codes in their empire-building activities. (laughs) Some European powers have gone to, quote, terrifying lengths, end quote, to subjugate other peoples and steal their lands. The downside of international trade, the downsides of international trade are also criticized from this vantage point. In Hindustan, quote, under the pretense of establishing economic undertakings, bracket, the British, end bracket, brought in foreign soldiers and used them to oppress the natives, excited widespread war among the various states, spread famine, rebellion, and perfidy, perfidy, the whole litany of evils which afflict mankind, end quote. If colonialism is a facet of what we today call globalization, so too is the very world-spanning moral culture that provides grounds for colonialism's condemnation. Globalization simultaneously produces both imperialism and the moral norms and means, e.g. newspapers of global reach, that condemn it. Here Kant anticipates the contemporary notions, themselves both empirical and normative, of the opinion-forming capacities of, quote, global civil society, end quote, Keen, 2003. The broader point here is that in Kant, there is a combination of the abstract cosmopolitical claims of Stoicism together with a historiographical attempt that in fact owes something to ancient historians, especially Polybius. To ground these in emergent world-level historical developments, Kant is both, cosmo- is both cosmopolitan philosopher and early theorist of globalization. Cosmopolitan political and moral conditions are not abstract ideas, but the emerging expression of an ever more densely connected world condition. This aspect of Kant's theorizing needs to become much more acknowledged in the standard histories of cosmopolitanism than it is currently. In this regard, it is worth noting recent endeavors to present Hegel, apparently an anti-cosmopolitan thinker because of his alleged fetishization of the national state as the ground of morality, as offering a more substantially empirically grounded cosmopolitanism than does Kant. While the recuperation of Hegel exemplifies, exemplifies very useful rethinking of the cosmopolitan canon, it should not do so through the means of caricaturing Kant as an abstract political thinker devoid of empirical orientations and sensitivities. Early Modern Cosmopolitics <sighs> Having re-narrated two, dimension of canonized co- two dimensions of canonized cosmopolitanism, ancient philosophies, and Kantianism, I will now turn to areas less recognized by the standard narration. 
A fertile ground for re-narrating cosmopolitanism is early modern Europe, even though at first glance it may seem unlikely. The early modern movement towards centralized states is well known, involving as it did the centralization of wealth and military might by states increasingly defined as, quote, national, end quote. The territorially bounded state was well on the way to becoming the politically excuse me, becoming the dominant type of polity in Western Europe by the mid-17th century. Political theory became ever more concerned with state sovereignty and the nature of relations between sovereign political entities. For this imaginary embodied most forcefully in Hobbes, warfare between sovereign states was inevitable and the interstate system is a perpetually violent state of nature. Given that each state was absolutely sovereign, there could be no legitimate international authority which would guide or control interstate relations. But for some contemporary thinkers appalled by the bloody warfare of the times, it was imperative that some sense of balance be struck between state autonomy and means of achieving peace. Jurists began to work out means by which relations between states could be established on some sort of at least minimal legal and ethical basis. In the treatise of the Spanish Jesuit Francisco Suarez de Legibus ac deo legislatore, treatise on law and God the legislator of 1619, it is admitted that, quote, a human legislative power of universal character and worldwide extent does not exist and has never existed, end quote. Murphy. But even in a system of sovereign states, there could exist a minimal sort of, quote, society, end quote, between states which regulated their interactions. Each state was part of a, quote, universal community, end quote the human race considered both as an animal species and as a moral entity joined together by natural ties of love and mercy. State sovereignty cannot be absolute, for all human beings rely on each other, and each state is, quote, a member of that universal society, end quote, called humanity. Minimal ethical obligations between states, such as not killing others' states' ambassadors, such as not killing other states' ambassadors, thus rest on and express a sense of common humanity. Suarez thus resuscitates the older Christian concept of, quote, universal humanity, end quote, within a context of state sovereignty, taming the latter through the former. At a more empirical level, he also insists on how all states need each other's assistance in one way or another. Each state requires, quote, some mutual assistance, association, and intercourse, at times, bracket, for its, and bracket, own greater welfare and advantage, but at other times because also of some moral necessity or need, end quote. Suarez thus provides an embryonic account of an interstate division of labor, which itself is seen as necessarily regulating states' behaviors, states' behavior towards each other. Jurists were also concerned with what might constitute a quote just war end quote. The late 16th century thinker Alberico Gentili, I guess it's Alberico. Gentili drew explicitly upon Stoic notions of universal brotherhood amongst all people to argue that if a sovereign monarch was treating his subjects excessively unjustly, it was right for another state to intervene. For Gentili, quote, the subjects of others, bracket, are not, end bracket, outside that kinship of nature and the society formed by the whole world. And if you abolish that society, you will also destroy the union of the human race. There must be someone to remind, bracket, rulers, and bracket, of their duty and hold them in restraint, end quote. 
Bellico Gentili. Here are the beginnings of a legal justification of international humanitarian intervention grounded on explicitly sto stoic cosmopolitical principles. Another important figure here is the early 16th century Spanish theologian Francisco de Vitoria. He is perhaps the first Western legal thinker systematically and explicitly to have thematized the quote, whole world, end quote, totus orbis, as an object of concern. Vitoria wrote about the legal and ethical aftermath of the Spanish conquest of the Americas, which along with Portuguese imperial expansion east to Asia had profound effects on contemporary understandings of the quote, world as a whole, end quote, as an increasingly interconnected entity. At least that one was like a set, like, thing. Like, Vitoria, Francisco de Vitoria was concerned with relations pertaining between all peoples on the earth, not just within Christendom, as had been the focus of earlier thinkers. Horrified by the brutal treatment meted out by the conquistadors to native peoples, Vitoria stressed the stoic theme that, because they were possessed of reason, the quote, Indians, end quote, were fully as human as Europeans and thus entitled to retain their land and properties. Francisco de Vitoria's vision was of a peaceful coexistence between different peoples across the planet, regulated by natural laws. Peaceful coexistence was possible through communication between different groups. The Ias Communicationis involved the freedom of all people to, quote, travel over the world's lands and sea, freedom of trade, freedom of entry and settlement for foreigners, and the duty of rulers to respect these rights, end quote. All of these were rules that Francisco de Vitoria was painfully aware had been ignored by the Spanish in the Americas. Although Vitoria's was an isolated voice at the time, he is noteworthy because of his novel analytical focus on the notice, notion of totus orbis, which he takes from Stoic political theory and historiography. His understanding of this as a legal entity in itself and his prefiguring of later visions of a world condition characterized by open trade and other forms of free intercourse among all people. In the case of Vitoria, we see how the dynamics of early modern globalization, especially in terms of burgeoning trading networks, both impacted upon and were understood through reconfigured notions of the world as a whole that were inherited from Stoic theoretical and historiographical cosmopolitanism. Vittoria's vision also explicitly connects cosmopolitan concerns to the depredations of European colonialism, a theme returned to by Frantz Fanon in the 20th century, as we will see below. Economic and Social Cosmopolitanism If the emerging realities of embryonic world-level commerce and imperial plunder informed appropriations of Stoicism by early modern jurists, so too would the increasing importance of cross-planet trade be reflected in the cosmopolitical visions of the 18th century. As we have already seen in the case of Kant, it is wrong to limit the history of cosmopolitan thought only to the canonized 18th century political theoretical writers. The cosmopolitical responses by other sorts of authors to what were viewed as the increasingly cosmopolitan conditions of global trade should be mentioned. Tom Paine, not usually included as a part of the cosmopolitan canon, echoed much radical and liberal thought of the time when he argued that, quote, if commerce were permitted to act to the universal extent to which it is capable, it would extirpate the system of war and produce a revolution in the uncivilized state of governments, end quote. Likewise, a more obvious cosmopolitan figure, Voltaire, discerned in the workings of the bourse the dynamics <sighs> excuse me likewise a more obviously cosmopolitan figure Voltaire 
discerned in the workings of the Bourse the dynamics of interstate, intercultural, and even interreligious cooperation and harmony. In the stock exchange, quote, in the stock exchanges of Amsterdam, London, Surat, or Basra, the Geber, the Barlian, the Jew, the Mahat, Mohammedan, the Chinese Deist, or Deist, I think it's, yeah, that's how you say it. I think it's Deist, Brahmin, the Greek Christian, the Roman Christian, the Protestant Christian, the Quaker Christian, trade with one another. They don't raise their daggers against each other to gain the souls for their religion, end quote. Voltaire. In this vision, burgeoning world trade greatly facilitates international peace and religious tolerance. Commercial self-interest is distinctly cosmopolitan in nature because it leads to peaceful interaction between different states, cultures, and religious groups. In The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith noted that the development of the wealth of a particular country should for people in all other countries be a matter for, quote, emulation, not of national prejudice or envy. Each nation ought not only to endeavor itself to excel, but from the love of mankind to promote instead of obstructing the excellence of its neighbors, end quote. Mm -hmm. Such benefits of free trade are regarded from a cosmopolitan point of view in Smith, even though he retained the hard-headed position mm -hmm. that in empirical situations, what should be the case need not actually be so. The wealth of a particular nation can excite jealousy mm -hmm. and antagonism among those abroad, leading to war and imperialist expropriation. The complicated relationship of Karl Marx to cosmopolitan thinking and practice has already been laid out extensively, but it is also worth noting, excuse me, it is also noteworthy that 19th century liberal ideas as to free trade can be construed as particular sorts of cosmopolitan thinking. Robert Cobden, leader of the British Anti-Corn Law League, remarked, quote, free trade, what is it? Why breaking down the barriers that separate nations, those barriers behind which nestle the feelings of pride, revenge, hatred, and jealousy, end quote. For Cobden and many others, free trade would come over time to be seen by governmental leaders the world over as a more efficient way of generating national wealth and welfare. Military organizations would be made redundant in a commercially integrated world as the main dynamic of world-level interactions shifted from politics to commerce. A liberal vision of a global future marked by peaceful relations between states characterized the nascent discipline of sociology as much as it did political economy. A sociology reconfigured economic ideas about the division of labor. A specifically sociological set of cosmopolitan dispositions were formed from the early 19th century onwards. We can see this in the work of Herbert Spencer, who predicted a universal moment, excuse me, a universal movement from, quote, military society to, quote, industrial society. A condition where economic and political autarky were laid aside in the universal evolution towards world level economic interdependence. Just as much as economic liberalism, utopian socialism, another important influence on embryonic sociology, also espoused such a vision. Saint Simon and his followers argued that the end point of human history, quote, is universal association. The association of all men on the entire surface of the globe in all spheres of their relationships, end quote. The Stoic idea of, quote, humanity as a whole, end quote, is here recalibrated to become a product of the emerging global division of labor such that over time, quote, the various nations scattered over the face of the earth shall appear only as members of one vast workshop, working under a common law for the accomplishment of one and the same destiny, end quote. The same sentiments were echoed by Comte in his school. The analytic object of Comtean sociology is an explicitly cosmopolitan one, again indebted to Stoicism. The mass of the human species, whether in the present, the past, or even the future, bracket which, end bracket, increasingly constitutes in every respect, both in space and in time, an immense and eternal social unity, 
whose diverse individual or national organs, which are continually united by a close and universal solidarity, inevitably cooperate in the fundamental evolution of humanity." End quote. Comte, Auguste Comte. Here we see very clearly one of the most explicitly cosmopolitan dimensions of classical sociology before the sociological imaginary was sequestrated into the, quote, methodological nationalism, end quote, characteristic of the thinking of 20th century, quote, national sociologies, end quote. Cianillo. Comte's sociology also involved the development of the, quote, religion of humanity, end quote, a new secular religion which was to provide the newly industrialized nations with a common cultural bond akin to that which Catholicism had provided in medieval Europe. As Boaz summarizes, quote, Comte believed that human beings could be educated into acting with the same pacific motives toward other nationalities that they seemed to have toward their fellow citizens. Nations would learn to gather for mutual support. A byproduct of this arrangement would be universal peace, for war can be organized only for one's country, whereas labor becomes an instrument of humanity as a whole. The industrial state makes all nations spontaneously converge by assigning to each an end which can become universal, because it always remains external to any one nation. The exploitation of the natural resources common to all nations involves the division of labor equivalent to what one sees within separate societies. Such exploitation would be impossible without international cooperation." End quote. Such Comtean sentiments are found in another key sociological work, Durkheim's The Division of Labor in Society which can be viewed as that author's first attempt to propound a specifically sociological as to an economic or political theoretical cosmopolitanism attuned to the socio-economic political conditions of the day. In the famous account of burgeoning social complexity, actually I think it's pronounced Durkheim. Get out of here, squirrel. I ain't your friend. Goddamn squirrels. I'm at, a, I'm at school, so I'm on campus, and the squirrels on this campus are very people-friendly. But uh, some people like it. And maybe I like it if I'm in the proper mood, but I'm in reading mode now, dude. Don't, don't fuck around. Squirmy little things. Anyway, such Comtean sentiments are found in another key sociological work, Durkheim's Div The Division of Labor in Society which can be viewed as that author's first attempt to propound a specifically sociological as opposed to an economic or political theoretical cosmopolitanism attuned to the socio-economic political conditions of the day. In the, in the famous account of burgeoning social complexity, quote, organic solidarity, end quote, Durkheim notes that within one national society under conditions of organic solidarity, quote, the fusion of the different segments, bracket, of production, end bracket, draws, bracket, hitherto separate, end bracket, markets together into one which embraces almost all of national society, end quote. Quote. No, it was calling me. He then notes that this process, quote, even extends beyond, bracket, national frontiers, end bracket, and tends to become universal. For the frontiers which separate peoples break down at the same time as those, bracket, boundaries disappear, end bracket, which separate the segments of each of them, bracket, within each polity, end bracket. The result is that each industry produces for consumers spread over the whole surface of the country or even the entire world." End quote. Emile Durkheim. Mm -hmm. 
Thus, quote, national level, end quote, organic solidarity develops at the same time as, quote, international level, end quote, organic solidarity, leading to an ever more complex web of worldwide socioeconomic integration. Although generally unremarked upon until recently, it is clear that Durkheim's mature socio-political project was to formulate a brand of cosmopolitanism which would develop St. Simonian, Comtean, and Kantian ethical dispositions, grounding these empirically in the emerging tendencies of world-level socio-political socio -political order. His position is summarized in an address given at the Paris Universal Exposition of 1900. Quote, Doubtless, we have t towards the country in its present form, and of which we in fact form part, obligations that we do not have the right to cast off. But beyond this country, there is another in the process of formation, enveloping our, our national country, that of Europe or humanity. End quote. Luke's. Oh, no. End quote. Uh, Emile Durkheim. I guess that's quoted in Luke's. This view was elaborated in lectures Durkheim first gave in Bordeaux between 1890 and 1900, where he considers the apparently contradictory notion of, quote, world patriotism, end quote, endeavoring to take into account the apparently rigid realities of the contemporary international system while trying to raise the system to a certain ethical level, a la the efforts of the early modern jurists and Kant. World patriotism does not involve modes of affiliation to a putative, quote, world state, end quote, which he admits could only arise in the very distant future. Instead, it refers to a situation where each state encourages the highest moral sentiment among its citizens. Each national government endeavors, quote, not to expand or to lengthen its borders, but to set its own house in order and to make the widest appeal to its members for a moral life on an ever higher level. Civic duties will be only a particular form of the general obligations of humanity, end quote. Durkheim points toward a, quote, world culture, end quote, constituted of certain general moral codes which is contributed to by particular states and which is observed by all of them with specific national colorings. as regards the education of their citizens. Turner claims that, quote, in equating what he called, quote, true patriotism, end quote, with cosmopolitanism, Durkheim anticipated the modern debate about republicanism, patriotism, and cosmopolitanism by almost a century, end quote. He seems to anticipate Apaya's 1996 argument that a sense of belonging to a particular national community is necessary for actors to achieve more cosmopolitan political goals. And Habermas's idea of, quote, constitutional patriotism, end quote, as a way of reconciling actors' orientations and responsibilities towards, quote, cosmopolitical, end quote, institutions like the United Nations and their feelings of national identity. Durkheim, like Kant before him, or Kant before him, wished to root his political philosophical position in empirical world-level social conditions, this involving a move from political philosophy alone to historiography and sociology. This is what the late masterwork, The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life, published in 1912, set out to achieve. with an embryonic theory of globalization underpinning the account of world moral culture and political cosmopolitanism he had outlined elsewhere. In the book's later chapters, there is an account of the sociological reasons whereby a world-spanning cosmopolitan moral culture has developed at the present time. Durkheim argues that the case of the emergence of intertribal, quote, international life, end quote, in Aboriginal Australia mirrors the emergence of a global moral culture in his own time.
as different tribes or nation states interact ever more closely in conditions of organic solidarity, they create shared moral forms, such as commonly held divinities, totems and taboos, to which they all became ob obligated. Those who break the rules of this emergent global moral order are shunned, just as the civilized nations condemned the aggressive imperialism of Germany during the Great War. It is particularly through common rituals and shared ceremonies that this moral culture is created, developed, and reinforced. The intertribal social dynamics discernible in the aboriginal case are mirrored in the international dynamics of the present day with new senses of cosmopolitan morality being created through, for example, the participation of multiple nationalities at international expositions and congresses. The upshot is that today, quote, there is no people, no state that is not involved with another society that is more or less unlimited and includes all people. There is no national life that is not dominated by an inherently international collective life. As we go forward in history, these international groupings take on greater importance and scope. End quote. Emile Durkheim. Here again can be discerned a concern not just to unite the normative and the empirical realms, but to ground the former upon tendencies in the latter in order to avoid accusations of abstraction and utopianism. In this sense, Durkheim was more powerfully Kantian than he was, than he has often been given credit for when we regard the Kantian project in the manners proposed above. Cosmopolitanism and colonial encounters. One second. Let me check. I gotta check my phone real quick. <laughs> Cosmopolitanism and colonial encounters. One major objection to the theorizing of Durkheim on intergroup dynamics and the cosmopolitan conditions they create is that they gloss over issues to do with colonialism and imperialism. Durkheim was writing in the metropolitan center of a large European empire where relations between colonizers and colonized were far from being like the level playing field that he imagined as characterizing intergroup relations in Aboriginal Australia. Durkheim's imagining of the global conditions creating cosmopolitanism is a far cry from the contemporaneous analysis of world-level dynamics, such as Lenin's caustic diagnosis of the nature of the consequences of imperialism, where certain groups exploit and control others on a massive scale. For contemporary post-colonial critics, Durkheim's position seems far less convincing as an understanding of how the world actually works than, that, than does that of Vittoria several centuries before. This raises the issue of how to account for the roles of colonialism in the history of social and political theory. As Goh has argued, there has been a tendency in cosmopolitanism studies to treat colonialism as, quote, a temporary deviation in an otherwise linear narrative towards present-day cosmopolitanism, or as a purely negative force, end quote, working against cosmopolitan tendencies in the empirical domain. domain. Go suggests that while of course this is true in a general way, we can also usefully consider how, at least sometimes and in certain contexts, colonialism may have been partly generative of cosmopolitan theory and possibly practice too. Go cites the case of the Martinique-born thinker Franz Fanon, nowadays usually presented either as an advocate of violent anti-colonial political struggle or as an early instance of post-colonial theorists. Go, however, proposes to read Fanon's work as involving, quote, the colonial production of a particular form of cosmopolitanism, bracket, that produced, end bracket, a post-colonial cosmopolitanism, end quote. 
This can be situated as part of a much wider set of processes in the, quote, decolonizing, end quote, period, stretching from 1945 to the 1970s, whereby intellectuals living in the countries of the crumbling European empires sought to think through the contradictions of the colonial and emerging post-colonial conditions. Fanon's thought displays a deep ambivalence to the Enlightenment claims of the French state and its intellectual spokespeople. On the one hand, claims of universal fraternity were deeply, clearly hypocri hypocritical. On the uh, one hand, claims of universal fraternity were deeply, clearly hypocritical mouthed by the same white officialdom who were engaged in the most egregious acts against subject non-white populations. On the other hand, such ideals could not be rejected wholesale, as to do so would be to jettison the idea of all humanity co cooperating with, with and caring for each other. Without such a cosmopolitan ideal, the new autonomous states of Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere would fall into the trap of state-centered building, student, state building centered around callous ethno-nationalism, which might eventually pit them against each other in bloody conflict. The challenge, therefore, was to purge cosmopolitan sentiments of universal fraternity of the Eurocentric baggage that had built up around them throughout the era of the European empires. The French and more broadly European concept of quote humanity end quote had to be understood as a particularism which nonetheless contained within it seeds of a more genuinely universal and non-racist conception of the human species and the ethics by which different groups should treat each other. This new conception had to be forged by the hitherto colonized not taken up wholesale from erstwhile colonizers. In so doing, a new sense of the, quote, mass of all humanity, end quote, would be created, quote, whose connections must be increased, bracket, end, end bracket, whose channels must be diversified, end quote, guided by a rejuvenated sense of cosmopolitan connections among all social groups, the formerly colonized may be able to reach out to the former colonizers, such that the latter's, quote, rigid culture now liberated opens at last to the people who have really become brothers. The two cultures can finally enrich each other, end quote. In many cases, excuse me, in many ways, the cosmopolitan hopes of Fanon in the 1960s for reconciliation between colonizers and colonized did not come to pass. This is seen both in the ethnic tension of contemporary France and the rise of the National Front to political prominence on the basis of such tensions, and the dramatic replacement of cosmopolitan national liberation discourses by militant Islam in some of France's ex-colonies. Instead of the increasing cosmopolitanization, excuse me, cosmopoliticization of reality hoped for by Fanon, societies around the world seem to be moving in, or excuse me, seem to be moving in ever more decosmopoliticizing directions. Nonetheless, Fanon's message remains an important one. He saw the necessity of tempering nationalism, here the nationalism of newly emerging nations onto the world stage, with cosmopolitan dispositions. In this sense, he was not far, very far from Durkheim. Nationalism can, under certain circumstances, work, quote, as a basis for its own supersession, end quote. This is surely a pertinent message for the secessionist nationalist movements, such as the Scottish excuse me, secessionist nationalist movements, such as the Scottish and C Catalan, in the former colonizing countries like Spain and the UK, in seeking to escape from what nationalists regard as a colonial condition of political subjugation, Europe itself will be helped to re-cosmopolitize, excuse me, re-cosmopolitize, re 
if these new nation states firmly place their nationalist discourses at the service of broader cosmopolitan ideals. The Scottish case in particular possibly gives some cause for hope in that regard. I don't agree with any of that last couple of shit, but what anyway, who cares what I think. Conclusion. The case of Fanon illustrates well the point of re-narrating the history of cosmopolitanism thinking. He has not usually been considered a major cosmopolitan thinker, and his contributions are not yet integrated into mainstream debates in the field. The same can also be said for numerous other figures examined above. Many of these figures, despite their other differences, can seem as trying to can be seen as trying to integrate the thoroughly excuse me, integrate thoroughly the normative and empirical aspects of cosmopolitanism. It is important in our ongoing interpretations of the history of the field to place emphasis on the continuing theme of normative slash empirical integration in cosmopolitical thought, because otherwise the latter can be represented in too narrow a fashion, understood as the preserve of an elite of political philosophers engaged in abstract discussions devoid of empirical affordances. Previous attempts to think about and instantiate cosmopolitan conditions proved to be more interesting and perhaps more useful and relevant for us today, once we have both widened and deepened our retrospective visions of them. The field of cosmopolitanism studies must continually think in an, as open and creative ways as possible about the historical materials from which it can be reconstructed.